Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are on Collegiate Brothers. Hundreds of abstracts were recently presented at 2023 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. But as a community oncologist, a few key studies in a hormone receptor positive space should be on our radar. To cover these critical studies, we would like to welcome a world-renowned clinician and researcher, Dr. Hope Hugo. Dr. Hugo, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure and honor to talk to you today. Dr. Hugo, welcome. Dr. Hugo, we are hoping to cover four key studies from San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in Hormone Receptor Positive Space, starting off with Natalie trial, which is use of ribocyclib in adjuvant settings, diving into Monarch 3 after that, which is utilizing bemocyclib with AI in frontline metastatic patient population. We will then talk about Innovo 120 using enavolosib in patients with pic 3 c mutation, and then closing off with Tropion Breast 01 update with Dato DXD in endocrine resistant patient population. Before we talk, start talking about our first study, which is the Natalie trial, let's talk about what is the current standard of care, which is a bemocyclib in adjuvant setting, which is for high risk node positive patient population though. Natalie does include bigger inclusion criteria with the use of ribocyclib in adjuvant settings. Dr. Rugo, can you please walk us through the study design and its findings here? Absolutely. And indeed, uh, we don't know as much about the details of these patients as we will when the data is published. Uh, that will be quite helpful. Uh, we saw the first data from the Natalie trial at ASCO 2023, and the data at San Antonio provided us an update. Our most recent update from Monarch E was at ESMO 2023 when five-year data was provided, meaning that all patients have been off drug for a long time. The first report of the Natalie trial, of course, based on the design that I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, most of the patients were still on drug, whereas now we see that most of the patients are off drug. So Natalie had a unique study design, uh, several differences from the Monarch approach. First was the inclusion of patients with relatively lower risk disease. So as you can see, uh, there are three categories that include node negative disease where uh, Monarch E required that patients have at least one to three positive nodes. There was also a category with four or more positive nodes. So you could have node negative disease that was grade two, so relatively lower risk, uh, but evidence of high risk by either a high key 67 or a high genomic score or grade three histology. So three different ways of uh, joining the trial. And of course, anybody with node positive disease was eligible. And then unlike in monarchy where no, nobody had node negative disease, but if you were node positive, you had to have high risk features as well, which was not required in Natalie. And then patients who have bigger tumors um, or even uh, quite extensive tumors with you know N3 like disease could have uh, with uh, sorry T3 like disease could have been eligible even if they had no negative disease, which again is not the same as uh, Monarch E. The other difference is that patients were treated for three years versus two years. And then the third difference is that Although 600 milligrams is the approved dose for ribocyclib in the metastatic setting, a lot of data has shown similar outcome when patients are dose reduced to 400 milligrams due to toxicity. So because of the concern that after chemotherapy, neutropenia might be an issue, um, and I think confidence in the dose, 400 milligrams was the prescribed dose of a Natalie trial. In uh, Monarch E, you could use any endocrine therapy. In ribocyclib, uh, in the Natalie trial with ribocyclib, mainly because of concerns about some drug-drug interactions and monitoring the QT interval, uh, only non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors were allowed, which is, I think, important to keep in mind. So uh, it's actually quite interesting data. So you can see in the right-hand corner, the IDFS. So what is different from this presentation compared to ASCO 2023? There's an additional uh, just under six months of follow-up. Now the median follow-up uh, is uh, longer, so that's great, but it's still quite short for patients, particularly who have node negative uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Uh, the delta in terms of IDFS was relatively similar to what we saw just under six months with just under six months less follow-up, uh, which is, I think, to be expected. You don't expect to see big gains in 
IDFS with less than six months of additional follow-up, and that is shown on the right with a three-year IDFS rate. They also showed similar uh, distant disease-free survival uh, with the slightly longer follow-up. But I think what was really fascinating was looking at node negative versus N1 to 3. And when I mentioned we don't have the details, we don't actually know what the T was and what other risk factors were present in node negative disease here because eligibility was quite broad. That's going to be critical to understand this data because if you look at the uh, data now, what you can see is that the uh, difference in uh, node negative disease is quite narrow. The hazard ratio is very good, 0.723. But the difference in node negative disease is narrow and patients are doing reasonably well. This is all invasive disease events. Whereas in the patients who have node positive disease, you can see that the control arm has a three-year IDFS of only 87% and you're seeing a much a greater difference of over 3%. So, you know, I think that we're not ready to really understand the benefit based on this data of ribociclib in node negative disease. The follow-up is just too short, and you can see that patients do quite well. Um, and then by stage, you're seeing very similar data. So that kind of helps you think about the node negative patients were probably mostly stage two. Uh, and if you look at that difference in stage two, it's actually under 2%, although the hazard ratio is very good, suggesting that there might be a separation with longer follow-up, uh, which is what we saw in Monarchy, that the separation kept increasing over time. However, in stage three disease, the difference is quite uh, good, as you can see here, going from 83.8 to 88.1%. Um, so that actually is quite encouraging, although the hazard ratio, as you can see, is 0. 0.755. So, you know, all of these data are encouraging. It's just that for the lower risk population, we just don't have enough follow up to really understand what the true benefit is of taking a really long time of an additional agent that, although better tolerated than the 600 milligram dose, is still taking another drug that causes a number of different side effects. A little over a third of patients didn't complete three years. So now there's only 20% of patients still on drugs, so great data. But a lot of people discontinued before three years, and knowing how long they took drug will be important as we start thinking about how long the optimal duration of adjuvant CDK4-6 inhib inhibition is. Thank you for covering all that. Again, there are some key differences, but we really need long-term data. And, you know, we just touched upon picking the right CDK4-6 inhibitor, be it for side effects or how you partner up with the right AI. This is a good segue for our next study, 1R3. This is actually an eight-year follow-up because CDK4-6 like abemocyclib and ribocyclib have been standard of care options for our metastatic disease patients. Here, we see 13 months of difference in overall survival. However, the p-value is 0 0.06. Based on this data, are you going to change your practice, Dr. Rugo, or what's going to be your preferred CDK4-6 inhibitor? I thought this data was so interesting. You know, the progression-free survival is fabulous. The delay in time to chemotherapy is great. Uh, remember that, you know, patient populations differ no matter how similar the eligibility criteria are. Geographic uh, enrollment makes a big difference based on what you can access in terms of post-study treatment. Uh, and then, of course, you know how much, there, there's just a bunch of different factors, like whether the more tumors were luminal A or luminal B or some were basal-like or things that we, we don't assess when we're looking at demographics of patient populations. Uh, and I think that this, this uh, p-value really highlights those differences. And uh, I think uh, in, uh, uh, urges caution in cross-trial comparisons. Because in this trial, which only had 493 patients, so it's relatively smaller than some other trials, and the randomization was two to one, the primary endpoint of this trial, along with the other two first-line trials where aromatase inhibitors were paired with the CDK4-6 inhibitor, was progression-free survival. The hazard ratios were very similar across the three trials and excellent, as you can see, a 14.3% updated PFS in the intent-to-treat population. And I think that a difference of 13 months and also that that difference was maintained in the population with visceral metastases is, is quite impressive data. I don't think that the lack of statistical significance should alter any of our treatment practices or use of abemaciclib, but I think it really does highlight the issues between uh, heterogeneity and post-treatment uh, in terms of impacting outcome. 
we saw some very interesting data from a trial called Parsifal. They called Parsifal Long, where they did an analysis of some of the patients who were enrolled in a trial that compared uh, electrozole to fulvestrant as first-line treatment for patients with HR-positive HER2-negative metastatic disease, and all patients received valvociclib, which, as you know, showed no survival benefit in the first-line setting in Paloma 2. The overall survival, the median overall survival in Parsifal Long, where they extended the evaluation to include overall survival was 65 months, which is identical to the overall survival from all two other trials. And the overall survival in Monarch 3 is identical to what we've seen in the Mona Lisa trials. So I think that, you know, we should use these drugs as we're using them now. Thanks for stressing that, Dr. Rugo, especially when you talk about that difference of overall survival, which is not trivial of 13.1 months. But again, we have been talking about the p-value, but we have to take it with a grain of salt, especially when you're talking about the visceral disease advantage here. And now you talk about the Percival uh, trial, which included palbociclib. Here is another trial, Inevo 120, which in fact did include palbociclib part of the regimen as well. And this is for PIK3CA mutation patient population. Dr. Ruger, your thoughts with the study findings and the designing? Yes, uh, this uh, trial is near and dear to my heart. I was uh, The press release came out on Tuesday of San Antonio, um, and uh, some of us gathered together to try and see if we could get the data presented on Friday. Because if you have a press release <laughs> for San Antonio, you're, the data is made public six months later. That's sort of a tragedy in a way, right? Um, even if you publish at the same time, that's a long time where people can't see the data and evaluate it in a public forum. And although... As my colleagues at Genentech Roche pointed out, there's a lot of leakage of data among excited investigators. But um, the you know the trial is a is a really fascinating and unique trial, and because we worked on trying to get it presented, and uh, our industry partners and our colleagues who were on the steering committee uh, were so uh, willing and able to make this happen with just a two and a half day turnaround time, it's amazing. Uh, I was actually fortunate to be the discussant for the. Uh, trial at uh, San Antonio, the last scientific presentations. And so I know a lot about the trial and I'm very impressed with the data. So preclinical data suggests that if you add a PI3 kinase inhibitor to the combination of endocrine therapy and a CDK4-6 inhibitor in tumors that have PIK3CA mutations in PDX and preclinical models, that you can delay the development of resistance and markedly improve response as duration of response as well. And these are preclinical data. And as clinicians, you know, we always view them with more than a grain of salt. Uh, there were two sequential publications on this. And then attempts to combine triplet therapy were met with difficulties with toxicity. So this is a trial that looked at an alpha-specific, not yet approved, it's kinase inhibitor called inovolacid, and combined this drug with fulvestrant and palpociclib compared to placebo fulvestrant and palpociclib. But because there was a lot of interest in trying to delay resistance, uh, the trial targeted patients who had defined by ESMO, ESO, either primary or secondary endocrine resistance. So you either had to have progressed within the first two years of endocrine therapy, that would be primary endocrine resistance, or while still on endocrine therapy after two years, uh, or within a year of completing endocrine therapy. So this is actually a very high risk group. So 325 patients were randomized one to one. About a third of them had primary endocrine resistance, where the PFS in the first line setting is even shorter. Uh, and as you can see, the progression free survival was dramatically longer, twice as long in patients who received inovolacid versus placebo. 15 versus 7.3 months with a hazard ratio of 0.43, and the curves separate very early, suggesting that you're able to overcome that initial endocrine resistance that we see with those big fall-offs in the first uh, three months you know, where you're getting your first scan on study. So very, very exciting to see. There's also a trend towards overall survival benefit as well. And so then the question comes up about what about toxicity? This trial included patients who did, had a fasting glucose of less than 126 and a hemoglobin A1C less than or equal to 6%. So patients, most patients with pre-diabetes have been excluded, some included, uh, but nobody with diabetes. They didn't see a lot of grade 3 diabetes because of the grade 3 hyperglycemia, only a little over 5%. They saw some stomatitis, but again, grade 3 was only a little over 5%. So I think the you know big question is, 
uh, what happens when we treat patients who have poorly controlled glucose. And that is a planned study for the future to try and see if we can prevent hyperglycemia. But the data is quite striking. And we'll look for results com directly comparing inovolucib to alpelucib with full vestibule with an ongoing trial with inovolucib that I hope will complete it and present data in the near future. But this data is proof of concept from a laboratory investigation done over a decade ago. Uh, really exciting to see. But just to get an idea about if we are to utilize inovolucib, if it does get approved, though this trial did include albacyclib, would you consider utilizing other CDK4-6 inhibitors, that is ribocyclib or abemocyclib? That is a very good question, and no. The answer to that is really a strong no. Until we see the uh, com triplet combination safety, I would really advise strongly against that because there are drug-drug interactions that you really can't predict, and uh, you could put your patient into a difficult situation for no clear benefit. The triplet is being evaluated in uh, the Morpheus Pan Tumor Study now, but we have seen zero data, and it was a relatively recent arm that opened. We have to see safety from triplet combinations with the specific drugs that we're going to use before we want to apply them to clinical practice. Okay, Rugo, thank you for covering that. Now, focusing on endocrine resistant disease with Tropion Best 01 study looking at Dato DXD, another Trope 2 antibody drug conjugate. Here, this is the space where we also have map from your study. Dr. Rugo, your take on it. This is not yet approved. We're seeing PFS. We have OS with sasetizumab. What are we making out of this data set? Well, you know, it's an interesting question I, about what do uh, trope 2 antibody drug conjugates do? I, obviously, Dato DXD, Dato Potomab, Dorextacan, and sasetizumab govitecan are different. They carry a different payload, although it's the same uh, type of payload, topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, and the antibodies are different, although they both target trope 2. Uh, this study included patients who had a median of one line of prior chemotherapy, a maximum of two lines, HR positive disease, so that's uh, a less heavily pretreated population than tropics, where we treated patients with a median of three lines of prior chemotherapy, where all almost all patients had visceral disease. But uh, what's striking to me was, I, and I've been involved in Tropion Brevist one as well, uh, is that the median PFS is uh, 4.5 to 6.9 months. We see that fall off that we're used to seeing in patients who receive a lot of endocrine therapy and prior chemotherapy. And then a hazard ratio 0.64, actually relatively similar to what we saw in the Tropics trial, although obviously PFS is better. Uh, the absolute delta is a little better in this less heavily pretreated patient population. So it suggests that TROPE 2 ADCs kind of fit into a different class than the uh, HER2 ADC with its really surprisingly excellent results in HER2 low breast cancer, uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan. But the benefits are quite uh, good here. We're seeing uh, delta at 6, 9, and 12 months, which is quite nice. Um, and uh, of course, meeting the end point of improvement in progression-free survival. At, that data was presented at ESMO uh, by Aditya Bardia on behalf of our uh, investigators. But then at San Antonio, there was a lot of interest in subset analyses. And you have one specific subset here looking at CDK46 inhibitor duration, because in tropics, there was some question about whether or not prior duration of CDK46 inhibitors impacted efficacy. But actually, it's important to keep in mind, tropics was done a long time ago relative to tropion, the excitement out of, about enrolling patients. And of course, the eligibility and less heavily pretreated patients resulted in very, very fast accrual to tropion breast one uh, So, you know, these patients had received CDK4-6 inhibitors largely. You know, they had received less chemotherapy. It's just impossible to compare between the two studies. Uh, but here you can see that the benefit uh, in patients, regardless of whether they were, are more have more endocrine-resistant disease or less endocrine-resistant disease, is almost identical. The patients who had a CDK4-6 inhibitor for more than 12 months still have a better PFS, 7.1 months versus 5, and you're down to the 6.9 versus 4.2 for the less than 12 months. Similar hazard ratios. Very, very encouraging to see this excellent data in this subgroup and in all of the other subgroups that Aditya reviewed at the presentation. I think the key differences here are in safety. <clears throat> uh, Dadopotomab drugsican, which we have a lot of experience with in our iSpy2 uh, neoadjuvant uh, trials, 
you know, where we use different agents sequentially. Uh, we looked at data potomab Durexican with or without Durvalumab in patients who have high risk early stage breast cancer, all of her two negative. Uh, so, you know, we gave four doses to these patients who never received any prior treatment. And like Tropion Bresto 1, the most common toxicity that is an issue for patients is stomatitis. However, we used an aggressive mouthwash approach with the steroid mouthwash that we first piloted and published on with Everolimus in the SWISH yep. trial. And of course, you know, because I was so involved in that, and uh, we really pushed this in iSpy. I'm the safety officer for iSpy being Ananda. So uh, with the steroid mouthwash, my personal experience is both in Tropion as well as in iSpy, that you can really control most patients' stomatitis pretty well. You don't really get diarrhea, and the cytopenias are quite uncommon. Some people get cytopenias. The use of growth factors is very, very low. So overall, the tolerability of this drug is pretty good. I will say that both of these trope 2 ADCs result in alopecia, um, and uh, this drug is given every three weeks. So we do need to wait for survival data from uh, datapotamab virextican, but I think we all expect this to show uh, that it will show a survival difference, but time to tell. Thanks for covering that. It is very important to keep these ADCs in mind because they are truly changing the treatment paradigm and they are here to stay. Dr. Rugo, thank you so much for taking the time to go over these critically important studies from San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in uh, hormone receptor positive space. For our listeners, let's go over a quick recap. We've covered four important studies for looking at ribocyclob in adjuvant settings. This study even includes some node negative patients and we continue to see benefit in all subsets. We then covered Monarch 3 update, which showed 13 months of overall survival benefit with abebacyclib in first line, but the p-value was 0.06. We don't anticipate this changing our day-to-day -day practice all that much. We've also covered Innova 120, which showed significant PFS improvement with a new PIK3CA inhibitor along with fulvestrin and palbocyclib in first line for PIK3CA mutated disease. To close, we focused on Tropion BRASTO1 study update for DATO DXD in endocrine resistant patient population. DATO DXD showed improvement in PFS and it is very likely to get approved down the line in this setting. Make sure to check out our other San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium and ASH 2023 highlights. Thank you for tuning in with us. We are the Oncology Brothers.